Torchbearers of History, a connected series of historical sketches. Volume 1, From the Earliest Times to the Reformation, by Amelia Hutchinson Sterling. Chapter 8, Hypatia, the Decay of Greek Civilization. The reign of Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, was on the whole a time of peace and prosperity for the great city. But nevertheless, it was the beginning of the end of Roman greatness. The Roman people had lost their old ideal. They had no longer the freedom of their state at heart. They were no longer willing to sacrifice life and happiness, or even ease and comfort to secure it. The wealth, too, that poured into Rome from the various conquered countries helped to weaken and corrupt the people. Year by year, they became more fond of ease and splendor and luxury. Year by year, they became less willing to work or to exert themselves in any way, even to fight for their own country. And, as there was plenty of money to hire other people to fight for them, they began to think that it was altogether beneath the dignity of the free-born Roman citizen to do so himself. But they became proud and haughty, as well as idle and luxurious. Still, though not in true greatness, Rome continued to grow in size even after the reign of Augustus, until, as I have told you already, it stretched over all the world, that is, which was known at the time. For it was not till long after the fall of the Roman Empire that America and Australia were discovered. For centuries, a Roman governor ruled in our own island of Britain, as well as the countries even more distant from Rome. I am going to pass over the first 400 years of the Christian era. The history of the time is not pleasant to read. It is full of accounts of petty wars and uncivilized people, which would bring no glory to the Roman conquerors, of the fierce struggles by which one ambitious man after another raised himself to a throne and of the treachery and crimes by which one emperor after another kept himself on it. For though some of the emperors were good, well-meaning men, most of them were wicked and cruel as they could be. It was in the reign of the first emperor, Augustus, that Jesus Christ was born. Many years after, the Christian religion began to spread in Rome. It gave good opportunity to some of the emperors to show their cruelty and brutality and many were Christian men and women who were put to death by horrible torture because they would not give up their faith. There is a story that Emperor Nero, 54 to 68 AD, one of the most cruel and wicked men who ever lived, once set fire to Rome, that he might have pleasure of seeing how Troy looked in flames and afterwards accused the Christians in the city of having done it. He then ordered several of them to be seized and put to death in the most inhuman way. Some were wrapped in the skins of wild beasts and were then hunted and torn to pieces by dogs, and others were covered with pitch and then set on fire in the gardens of the emperor's palace, while the emperor and his wicked friends looked on in amusement. During the times of emperors, the Romans, who had got to hate work and fighting, were very fond of shows of all sorts and they had a huge circus built called the Colosseum, the ruins of which are still standing in Rome. Here, the Christians would not renounce their religion, were sometimes made to fight on the stage with wild beasts for the amusement of the Romans, who sat and looked on in safety, sometimes applauding and sometimes hissing. But at last, in the 4th century AC, one of the emperors, Constantine, became a Christian himself. In consequence, it is said of having seen the appearance of a cross in the sun, and in 313 AD he proclaimed that everyone was to be free to worship in any way he liked, and the Christians were allowed to get back again the land and money which had been taken from them. It was not very long afterwards, in 325 AD, that the great conference of Christian clergy, the Council of Nicaea, was held. After Constantine's proclamation, hundreds of people became Christians. But though they believed in the Christian religion, they were still, at least many of them, 
far from possessing the gentle, forgiving spirit. Before I pass on to it, however, I should like to mention here that the same Emperor Constantine removed his seat of empire from Rome to Byzantium, a town on the shores of the Bosporus, the strait between the Sea of Marmora and the Black Sea. This town he greatly enlarged and improved, naming it in honour of himself, Constantinople, by which name it is known to this day, when, not very long after the time of Constantine, the Roman Empire, grown too large for one king to rule over it, is divided into two, the Empire of the East and the Empire of the West. Constantinople became the capital of the Eastern, while Rome remained the seat of the Western Empire. It was about the end of the 4th century AC that Hypatia was born at Alexandria. I have already told you that Alexander the Great of Macedon founded a town in Egypt, which he called after himself Alexandria, so that it was more than 600 years old when Hypatia was born there. At that time, as it had been for centuries, it was one of the most celebrated and most important towns in the world. If you look at it on your map, you will see it held a very important position. It was on the way between Europe and India, for at that time people always went from Europe to India by Red Sea, and it was a central meeting place for merchants from Europe, Asia, and Africa. There, merchants of India would exchange for Roman money their rich silks and perfumes and precious stones, which were afterwards to adorn the proud, luxurious Roman ladies. But Alexandria was a great centre, not only of commerce, but also of learning. After the fall of Greece, it was at Alexandria that learned men from all parts of the world gathered, attracted, no doubt, by the splendid library which the city contained. During the first three centuries after its foundation, the city was the capital of the kingdom of Ptolemies, the descendants of Ptolemy, one of Alexander's generals. On the death of Alexander, became the king of Egypt, but in the reign of Augustus, Egypt became a province of Rome. Hypatia was the daughter of Theon, a great mathematician. When she was a girl, she showed so much talent that her father sent her to Athens to study, and there she learned to love with all her heart, beautiful Greece, and everything Greek, above all, Greek learning. Now, at the time, more than half a century after Constantine's celebrated proclamation of liberty to the Christian, the Christian religion had come to be the religion of the great Roman Empire. But though Christians in name, the people were still far from understanding the true meaning of Christianity, and they often did as wicked, cruel things to the pagans, as the followers of the old Greek and Roman religions were called, as their pagan fathers and grandfathers had done to the Christians. Among other acts of those early Christians was the destruction of many beautiful buildings and the works of art of the Greeks. We hear of the bands of monks in the 4th century wandering about from place to place, tearing down and destroying whatever treasure of Greek art or learning they could lay their hands on. They were foolish enough to think that it was doing God a service to do away with every trace of the genius of Greece, to a face over the wide empire of Rome, the footsteps of beauty, the spirit which God had sent into the world. You can well imagine how the heart of Hypatia, in which the dying Greek spirit was still alive and strong in its beauty, must have swelled to bursting when she heard of the deeds like them. Hypatia was not a Christian. Very likely, the fierce zeal and destructive acts of those well-meaning but foolish monks would prejudice her against the religion of which they were professed followers and prevent her from giving serious attention to the Christian Bible. At any rate, she remained through her life what she had been brought up, a pagan. When she returned to her native city from Athens, accomplished in all learning of the Greeks and with a heart aglow, with reverence, for all that was great and beautiful and noble in ancient Greece. She began to give lectures on science and philosophy, which were attended by many of the learned men of Alexandria. 
It was not only her learning which drew people to her lectures. We are told that she was remarkably beautiful, amiable, and attractive, and Orestes, the governor of Alexandria, had such high opinion of her wisdom that he would often consult her on matters concerning the government of the city. For some years after her return home, Hypatia seemed to have led a peaceful life, occupied in thinking, in reading her beloved old Greek philosophers, and in teaching till about 412 AD, when a new bishop or patriarch, as he was called, was appointed to Alexandria. This was Cyril, a zealous but fierce Christian, who had a fierce hatred of heretics, with such intense hatred which often led him to commit acts of cruelty. Between the bishop and the governor, the friend of Hypatia, there seems to have been a strong feeling of jealousy, which broke out some three years or so after the appointment of Cyril, when there arose a dispute between them. Almost ever since the foundation of Alexandria, a very large number of Jews had lived in the city. They were peaceful citizens enough, but Cyril could not endure that the people who had crucified Christ should dwell in a Christian city, of which he was bishop. So he asked the governor to send them away. Orestes consulted Hypatia, and acting on her advice, refused to grant the bishop's request. Cyril was very angry at this refusal, and the wrath of his zealous followers rose to such height that they were carried to commit a terrible act. As Hypatia was driving in her chariot one day through well-known streets on her way to give her usual lecture, her mind probably pondering on some deep thought of Plato or Aristotle, and heeding little what was around her, her chariot was suddenly stopped and surrounded by hooting, hissing rabble. Starting up, Hypatia gazed around her in amazement on the sea of furious faces and on the fierce eyes that glared with hatred upon her. In her clear accents, full of gentle and calm dignity, she tried to soothe the excited mob, but her words were drowned in loud shouts of, Down with the pagans! To the church with her! Then the beautiful, unoffending woman was roughly dragged by dozens of rude hands to a church, a Christian church, that stood near. There, before the altar, they stripped her and tore her limb from limb, cut her to pieces with oyster shells, one writer says. So perished Hypatia, the last of the Greeks, she in whom the Greek spirit may be said to have died, or rather to have fallen asleep, only to wake again, with new beauty and strength, in what is called the Renaissance. The classical period is now at an end. The learning of Greece and the power of Rome have each done what they could to civilize and raise mankind.